Oh, hi, morning everyone. Uh, sorry about the slight delay on that. Uh, we had a few technical uh, hitches there this morning. Uh, my name is Joanna Newell and uh, I'm from Canesham Consulting and I'm doing the talk today on uh, coronavirus business planning. Uh, so firstly, thank you to Michelle for having me on this morning. Um, I believe she's uh, quite busy at the moment behind the scenes uh, sharing it to all the other groups around so I will give her a little bit of time to do that. Uh, it must be quite a big job these days as I know she's been very busy expanding the network. Um, so it's lovely to be here with you this morning on this slightly a sunnier morning for a change. So while I'm giving her the time to do that uh, I'll just introduce myself properly. Uh, my name is Joanna Newell and my business is Canesham Consulting. I'm a chartered accountant and my specialist area is retail, wholesale and other product-based businesses. Um, my background is that I've worked in um, high street brands since I qualified and um, my main aim is to help business owners get a better understanding of profit and cash in their business. Um, I set up my business uh, because um, I needed the flexibility around working hours. Um, I qualified as a chartered accountant and uh, since then my office hours have been quite long. So while I'm waiting for Michelle to uh, share to the other groups, I'll just let you know um, what's coming up in the talk. And if any of you want to share it to your own pages, that would be great. Feel free to do that. So the topics I'm going to cover today... Um, firstly, while I did call it coronavirus business planning, uh, the first couple of topics are more general. Uh, they're questions that I've been asked a lot, so I thought now would be a good time to cover them. Firstly, I'm talking about the difference between an accountant and a bookkeeper. I'm talking about the differences in those roles and how business owners work with those two. Uh, then we're going on to looking at different business structures, talking about the difference between being a sole trader and the uh, director of a limited company, uh, the pros and cons of those, and again, how they differ. Then I'll be moving on to the more coronavirus-specific topics. Um, obviously, a lot of us are working from home at the moment, so a big area is knowing what costs you can claim as a business owner from working at home. And there's different, uh, different rules for directors and for sole traders, so again, I'm going to cover both those off. And then the last topic I'm going to go over is um, more of a sort of a summary and a big roundup of all the different uh, support packages that have been made available by the government. Uh, the feedback that I've had is that um, there's a lot of support out there and people are just finding it a bit tricky to, um, to know which bits are, are relevant for them. So I'm going to do a big roundup and then... Um, have, try and sort of group it a bit. So we've got sort of individuals, we've got companies and other sort of relief schemes. So hopefully point people in the right direction on all those. So I think Michelle has got it all set up now. Uh, so again, if you want to share it to your own pages, please feel free. That would be great. So starting off with the topic of um, bookkeeper versus accountant. Um, I do get asked this question a lot and how you sort of work with those two professionals. Um, so the work of a bookkeeper is more focused on uh, sort of recording and organising your financial data. That would involve things like um, purchase invoices, uh, processing them and paying them. Um, it would be about raising uh, sales invoices, posting bank transactions, uh, expense claims. Uh, they would probably do your payroll and they might be able to do your VAT returns as well. The work of an accountant is more focused on um, sort of analysing, interpreting and presenting your financial data. So that would involve things like uh, your monthly management accounts, um, cash flow management, um, VAT returns, particularly if it's a more complex one, uh, your annual accounts, your corporation tax returns. And they would also be able to help with things like detailed financial analysis, if there was any particular area of your business that needed a bit more attention, they could help you with that. And um, things like strategic planning, helping you sort of give you direction and focusing you on moving forward. Um, so while the roles are a bit different, 
Um, my experience is that, uh, particularly as small business owners, it's not really practical or cost-effective to work with two professionals. Most people just work with one. And again, the, the structure of your business might dictate which one you work with. A, uh, a limited company will always need an accountant to file your annual accounts. So I think most limited company directors start working with an accountant first. Um, and then uh, the way they normally work with that accountant is they will probably keep some of the sort of bookkeeping work themselves. So they will do the um, processing and paying invoices and bank transactions. They might collate all of that in a big sort of spreadsheet or list of income and expenses and pass that on to their accountant. Uh, maybe as your business grows, if that bookkeeping work gets too much for you, then that might be a good time to engage a bookkeeper. Um, and they could do that sort of collating work and pass it on to your accountant. Or depending on the relationship you have with your accountant, you might just want them to do it all for you instead. And of course, the way you work with them also depends on your own preferences. I know some people who just hate anything to do with the financial side of things and would just rather pass everything, bank statements, um, invoices, everything off to their accountant. Um, I conducted a poll recently in one of the Facebook groups I'm in asking small business owners um, when they got themselves an accountant. And the feedback was that 55% got an accountant straight away from day one. 23% uh, don't have one but think it would help them. 15% got an accountant when they were more established. 4% don't have one as they do it themselves. And 3% were apparently still undecided on the issue. Um, uh, so as I mentioned before, it does also depend on the business structure you have, uh, which brings me on to the next point of discussing the differences between a sole trader and uh, being a limited company director. So starting with a sole trader, that's um, it's a self-employed person who is the, is the only owner of the business and they work as an individual. Um, you keep all the business's profits yourself after you've paid tax on them and um, there's no legal separation between yourself and the business. Um, a sole trader is the most popular type of business structure. Um, figures from 2018 show that of the 5.6 million uh, small businesses, 3.4 million of them were sole traders. Uh, it's very simple to set up as a sole, sole trader. All you need is a national insurance number, and then you inform HMRC by registering for self-assessment. Um, that's probably the reason why they're so popular, because it's a little bit more complex to set up um, a limited company. And then you can choose to either trade under your own name or you can pick a business name. However, the business name is not legally protected because it doesn't have its own legal entity. So other people could trade under the same name. And again, because it doesn't have its own uh, legal entity, you are personally responsible for the debts and profits, of course, of the business. And that would mean that, of course, if the business fell into debt, you would be personally liable. And if there were any legal disputes, you could be sued personally. Um, as a sole trader, the money you withdraw is treated as salary and you pay national insurance on it. And then you have to submit a self-assessment tax return at the end of each tax year. Uh, sole traders can operate completely privately None of your accounts or records are made public in any way. Um, which is then, of course, in contrast to um, being a director of a limited company, uh, these sort of responsibilities are maybe a bit more complex than a sole trader. Um, however, with a limited company, that is a distinct legal entity from you as an individual. So you serve the company as a director and you make uh, financial decisions for that company. Um, but the business's assets and liabilities belong to the business and are completely separate from your own personal finances. Uh, since this does have a distinct legal entity, then the business name is protected and nobody else can trade under that same name. As a director, you do have responsibilities both to Company's House and to HMRC. You have to keep company records and update any changes. Uh, you have to file your company's uh, accounts with Company's House every year. 
you have to file a corporation tax return and, of course, pay corporation tax. Um, you can hire other people to do these responsibilities for you, like an accountant. Um, however, you are still legally responsible for those. Companies House and HMRC have different deadlines, which depend on your accounting year end. And then directors also have to submit self-assessment on their own personal income as well. Directors have different options on how they can withdraw money from their business. Uh, they can take it out as salary or as dividends. And, or, and you can choose how much you take out and you can leave them in uh, to boost the company's reserves if you choose. Um, as opposed to the sole trader, with a limited company, um, you're required by law to be transparent. Um, so information on your accounts, directors, shareholders, um, all has to be shared on the public register at a company's house, and that can be accessed by anyone at all. So uh, moving on to the um, more specific topic of running your business in this coronavirus situation, uh, most of the country was told to work from home during this lockdown period, and many people still are. Uh, so I'm just going to discuss the sort of business costs um, you can claim when you're working from home. The situations are different for a sole trader and a company director, so I will cover off both of those. So starting with the sole trader, um, working from home means you can claim part of your household costs um, as allowable expenses for tax. Um, the amount you can claim is based on the proportionate use of your property. And working out that proportion is normally based on time and space. Um, so, for example, if you have a particular room that you use for your business, then that's an easy way of calculating the space proportion. However, for example, if you had a particularly small property, it's likely that uh, you might not have a particular room dedicated to it. When you're working, you might be using the whole space, and then when you're not working, you might be using the whole space. So um, in that situation, basing it on time is probably a, a more appropriate measure. Um, the costs that you can claim when you're self-employed are mortgage interest or rent, uh, council tax, water rates, repairs and maintenance, insurance, heating and electricity, and cleaning as well. Um, then in contrast to a company director, you can only claim the specific additional cost of working from home, which is generally just heating and lighting. Where it's not very practical to calculate the exact cost of that, a flat rate is allowed, which at the moment is £6 per week. However, for directors, in order to uh, claim this, you have to be required to work from home. Simply choosing to is not enough. Uh, so, for example, if you run your company from home and you have no other business premises, then that's a fairly obvious need to have to work at home. Um, and obviously, in this lockdown situation, many company directors were required to work from home due to the government guidelines. Uh, so most company directors should be able to claim that allowance of £6 a week or more if you have the suitable calculations to support it. Uh, a question I've been asked on this is whether you can still claim um, these allowances when your business sort of trading has been reduced due to coronavirus. Um, and uh, personally, I've not seen any um, guidance to say you can't. Um, and again, most of, the, um, most of the claims are based on time and space. So even if your business income has been reduced due to reduced trading, um, you can still make the claim for it. A lot of people's time they've got to spend on their business has obviously been affected by these responsibilities. Um, but again, personally, I've not seen any guidelines to say you need to adjust your claim because of this. So I'm sure many of you are aware that the uh, government has come up with various support packages uh, for individuals and businesses during this coronavirus situation. And the feedback I've had is that a lot of people are finding it hard to sort of navigate it. There's a lot of support out there and they're struggling to try and identify which uh, schemes are right for them. So, um, and then obviously there was an update on Wednesday in the summer budget. So I'm going to try and give you a little roundup today of all the different schemes and point people in, 
the right direction, try and group them for individuals, companies, and then other just sort of general relief schemes. Um, and also, please excuse me, I am glancing at my notes a lot. <laughs> I don't normally use such thorough notes for doing a talk, but there's been quite a lot of details on these support schemes, and I didn't want to miss any important details, so please bear with me. So starting with individuals, um, obviously we've got the coronavirus job retention scheme, which is the furlough scheme, as it's more commonly known, and that is for employed individuals, um, and you get put on that scheme if there was not enough work um, due to your company trading being reduced. Employers can claim a grant covering 80% of the salary of the furloughed employee, and that's capped at £2,500 a month. Um, the scheme has been extended out to the end of October, with companies having to start making contributions from the 1st of August. And it covers full-time, part-time, agency, and employees on flexible and zero-hours contracts. Uh, the latest update from the government on Wednesday uh, is that it will wind down to the end of October as expected. And they are also offering now a £1,000 bonus uh, for each furloughed employee that is kept on until the end of January. And for self-employed individuals, there is the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme. And that's open to sole traders and business partners, but not company directors. It provides a taxable grant of up to 80% of your trading profits, again, capped at £2,500 a month. HMRC will apparently have contacted you if you are eligible and you apply online. There's a few conditions around that. You have to have submitted your 1819 tax return. You have to have traded in the 1920 tax year. And you should be trading when you apply or would be if it wasn't for coronavirus. Um, there's also a relief on income tax payments on account. So any payments on account that were due by the 31st of July 2020 can be deferred up until the end of January 2021. The deferment is optional. You can still pay it if you want. Um, and you can pay it any time up to the end of January. Uh, it's an automatic offer. You don't need to apply for it. And then uh, the update on Wednesday also brought us um, relief on stamp duty. Um, the threshold has now gone up to 500,000 and that is available until 31st of March 2021. And the other new relief is this Eat Out to Help Out, which offers people a £5 uh, rebate per person on eating out Monday to Wednesday. The restaurants need to apply for that. Um, you have to register and then you get reimbursed by the government. So moving on now to the support packages for companies. Um, obviously, they also benefit from the furlough scheme and they benefit from this new update of getting the £1,000 bonus for each employee they keep on. Then the other um, support packages available fall into uh, loans and grants. Um, so there's two types of loan scheme. The first is business interruption loan scheme. And that's for small and medium sized businesses to allow them access to overdrafts, loans, invoice financing, asset financing, up to £5 million for up to six years. Um, there's some incentives around that. The government will cover the first 12 months of interest payments and any bank fees. Governments are providing a guarantee of 80% of each loan. And there are 40 accredited lenders for this, including all major high street banks. The second one is the bounce back loan scheme. This enables smaller businesses to access finance uh, more quickly. The scheme helps small and medium sized businesses borrow from £2,000 up to 25% of their turnover and the maximum is £50,000. Um, again, there's a few incentives. The government will guarantee 100% of this loan and, there's, and they will cover interest and fees for the first 12 months. Uh, in terms of grants, there's three available for the sort of smaller sized businesses. The first is the Small Business Grant Fund, and you're eligible for that if you're based in England, uh, you occupy property, and you were eligible for the Small Business Rates Relief. Eligible businesses can get one grant per property. Uh, there's also the Retail, Hospitality and Leisure Grant Scheme. Um, businesses in England in those sectors are entitled to a one-off cash grant up to £25,000 from their local council. 
um, and obviously the properties have to be used either wholly or mainly for um, hospitality, retail or leisure. And then the third one, there is a local authority discretionary grant fund. This is for small and micro businesses with fixed property costs that have not been eligible for any of the previous two grants. Uh, you can get a grant of 25,000, 10,000 or any amount under 10,000. And you need to demonstrate that your business has suffered significant fall in income due to coronavirus. Um, local councils are asking uh, to prioritise businesses such as small businesses in shared offices or flexible workspaces, um, market traders, uh, bed and breakfast uh, properties that are paying council tax instead of business rates. Uh, there's two others which I'm not going to go into in a lot of detail. There's the Coronavirus Future Fund, which is more aimed for companies that rely on equity finance or have not been able to access other support because they're pre-profit or pre-revenue. And there's also support for larger businesses, which I'm not going to go into here. If anyone would like any more details on those two or any others, because I know I've skipped over them a little bit quickly, please let me know. Um, and then the last area of support packages is sort of relief. Um, first one is VAT deferral. Um, so VAT deferral was announced um, to help businesses that are experiencing cash flow problems. Um, all businesses can defer their VAT payments are due between 20th of March 2020 and 30th of June. You have until 31st of March 2021 to pay any uh, VAT you have deferred. Um, but you still have to submit your VAT return on time. Um, HMRC will also continue to pay repayment claims in that time. Uh, there's been relief on business rates for certain industries. Uh, business, relate, business rates holiday has been available for retail, hospitality and leisure sectors. And also some nursery businesses are able to uh, benefit from that. There is also protection has been offered to commercial tenants. So any tenants that cannot pay their rent due to the coronavirus are protected from eviction. It is, however, not a rental holiday. You still remain liable for all the rent, but you cannot be evicted in the meantime. There's also the relief on bad debt scheme. This is not a new coronavirus scheme. It's just something that was there anyway. That's probably just worth a little reminder. Um, if you are VAT registered and you have a debt that is more than six months old, you can reclaim the VAT on that. Um, if you subsequently recover the debt, you then have to repay that element of the VAT. Um, also, uh, on Wednesday, we also heard there's going to be a VAT reduction in the hospitality sector. VAT is going to be reduced from 20% to 5% on food and non-alcoholic drinks, and also on admission at attractions, which is until 12th of January 2021. Slightly random date. All the others seem to be month ends, but... Never mind. Um, so there's quite a lot of support out there. And if anyone would like any more details on those, I know I've been maybe a little bit brief on them. But if you need any support applying for them or any help to be pointed in the right direction, uh, please get in touch. You can drop me a message through Facebook or you can look me up uh, on the BWI members profile. Um, or you can go to my website and contact me through that. It's canesham.consulting.com. And if anyone has any questions in the meantime, I could see a few popping up. But I didn't really see them as I was going along. So maybe if you've got a question, if you pop it in now, because I may have missed it earlier on. Um, you know, there's been a lot there. I didn't mean to bombard you with a mountain of uh, information all in one go. Um, if anything occurs to you later, and you, again, you want to drop me a message through Facebook, my website, please let me know. Or if you want to chat about anything else, uh, discuss any other areas of your business, it would be lovely to hear from you. So please get in touch. So I'm not seeing any questions, any more questions pop up. So um, I will finish it there then. So thank you all very much for joining me this morning. And I hope you have a good weekend. And take care. Bye now. <laughs>